Over the last 50 years, Myrtle has given voice and fought for the rights and protections for 80,000 domestic workers in South Africa and 53 million more around the world. When Myrtle began, when Myrtle, when Myrtle began her fight in the 1960s, the standards protecting domestic workers were unacceptably low, unfair, and in many cases, non-existent. And while in many ways these standards are still unacceptably low and unfair, it is thanks in part to Myrtle's work that millions of workers around the world are better off today. To fully understand Myrtle's remarkable story, and appreciate the impact she has had, you must know where she came from. Domestic workers often live lives unseen, tucked away in rooms in the homes of their employers, where they're vulnerable to labor violations, lack of easy means of organizing, and struggle to avoid a debilitating cycle of poverty. Myrtle knows this because she was once a domestic worker herself. Her one-month-old son was separated from her because domestic workers could not live with their children or spouse. She worked for 12 straight years without a single paid holiday. To quote Myrtle herself, she had no rights and no voice. Those who spoke out were fired. She was a slave in her own country. But Myrtle was not unseen. In the 1960s, she wrote a letter to a newspaper challenging its negative depiction of domestic workers. Myrtle then acted against the seemingly immovable institutional framework constraining her and other domestic workers and held the first organized meeting of 250 South African domestic workers in Cape Town. She went on to form the first South African Union for domestic workers and created a second one after that. Today, Myrtle not only serves as General Secretary of the South African Domestic Service and Allied Workers Union, but also as the first president of the International Domestic Workers Federation, a global organization for domestic workers. She continuously advocates for fair wages and fundamental worker protections and played an instrumental role in mobilizing support for the first ever International Convention on Domestic Worker Rights adopted by the International Labor Organization in 2011. As an economist, I'm not an expert in morality, but I understand the economic importance of workers' voice and organizing. Economic research has confirmed what everyone in this room knows, especially Myrtle, that worker voice must play a critical role if we are to build a stronger economy with shared economic growth. Myrtle, you recognized injustice, rose above it, and then devoted your entire life to clearing a path for others to rise as well. Domestic workers across South Africa have felt your hand reach out to them, hold them up, and help them find their voice. Millions more around the world have been affected by your voice. Tonight, we honor your perseverance and commitment to this noble cause. Congratulations. Good evening. I, I was telling myself that I want to be a real lady. I'm going to read the speech, but along the way, it's not me. I cannot read the speech because I want to say what's in, what's in me.
I want to talk about me and our struggle. This award that I'm accepting tonight, it's an award that is in honor of the domestic workers. It's an award that I'm accepting on behalf of those that is still voiceless. I'm accepting this award tonight on behalf of those that cannot speak out for themselves, of the millions of migrant workers that is still suffering, of the millions of people that have not got a voice. I come from a country, South Africa, and maybe some of you don't know so much the history of South Africa. I was a slave in my own country. I was a domestic worker in the year 1967. And I don't know what they fear from us as women, but I remember quite clearly that I could not walk on the beach. I could not touch the water because the water was going to change color. I remember that we had separate cups and we had separate plates. I remember that we couldn't walk late at night. We were voiceless and we should not or dare not challenge the master. Whatever the master was saying to us, that was true. We have to believe him. And I remember that when I was a domestic worker and my mother died, I had two days to go and bury my mother. I remember when my father died, I had another two days and my employer saying to me, you can go back later, Myrtle, and you can cry later because we need you more than burying your mother or your father. I remember when my first child was born. She was one month old and I had to take her to my mother and I've seen her one year later. I remember all that, but I'm standing in front of you proud that I have been a domestic worker. Because if I was not a domestic worker, I wouldn't have been able to tell you tonight about our struggle. I remember the year 1967. Now we were not allowed to question the master, but I dared to ask. I remember there was an article, there was an article in the newspaper, and the article say that Domestic workers, you know everything about us. And I actually challenge, and I ask, why are we different? What makes us different? I'm the same as my employer, she might be white, I might be black, but we are two women in the same house, so why am I different? And the newspaper, I remember the media had a ball with me, how dare a domestic worker, because we are stupid, we don't know, we are uneducated, how dare she question the master? And I remember this media reporter coming and he was asking at the door, where is the nanny? I said, yes, no nanny. Where is the servant? I said, yes, no servant. Who are you looking for? Has you got a name? He said, yes, I'm looking for Myrtle. I said, well, this is Myrtle. <laughs> and he looked at me and I said, oh, you thought you're going to see somebody that don't have a voice. Some, and you thought maybe my employer wrote this letter? No, it's me. You know, we domestic workers, we are clever. And that was the start of where I am today. That is where I'm standing in front of you today. And then my employer, my employer said to me, you know, Myrtle, everybody is phoning you now because we did not have any off time. You know, domestic workers were working seven days a week and on a Sunday afternoon, you can go to church and then you come back. My employer said, Fine Myrtle, you can use the garage on a Sunday afternoon where you can sit and you can talk to domestic workers. Now, one thing that upset me most about us domestic workers, I was fortunate, I was educated. The reason why I became a domestic worker because South Africa had a problem with my color and they have to find out what am I, I'm not black enough, am I not white? And I end up being a domestic worker, so I was educated. And the one thing that struck me, that most domestic workers could not read and write. And I decided I'm going to start talking to domestic workers. And in my employer's garage, I'm starting to teach domestic workers to at least understand, to at least know their name. And that is how I started in the struggle. There was many with me, some was left, some is not with me on this earth anymore. There's many of us that have tried. We form a federation. 
we formed a domestic workers union in South Africa. I was locked up, I was away from my children. In the same time I got divorced, I had three children, I reared them and I promised myself, being a domestic worker, I'm going to make sure that my children are educated. And today I'm the proud mother to say all my children are educated and they all have well, good jobs. So I thank God for that. So what happened? What happened to free ourselves? In South Africa, although we had 1994, we were free in South Africa, but domestic workers were still last on the agenda. Even our very democratic ANC government, because we were working for them, they were pushing our laws to the back. And we challenged our government. We chained ourselves to the gates of parliament. We locked our minister up and we put away the key until they give in today. Today, South Africa got beautiful laws. South Africa got every law for the domestic worker. But this was not enough because there's a struggle in the world. So I found myself, several, many years later, I found myself at the ILO. I did not know what was the ILO. We always heard people talking about the ILO. And I found myself being at the ILO. And I found that we are being challenged by business. We are being told by people that it's not, we cannot give you a law, you are voiceless people. And of course we were told that, why should you want a law, you are part of the family. Now we're not part of anybody's family. I work for you, you pay for me, I'm not part of your family. Because if I'm part of your family, then you tell me to relax, you do the work, and then I'm part of your family. <laughs> so, I was never part of your family. So what happened? 2011, after three years of talking, campaigning at the ILO, we won Convention 189. What does Convention 189 mean for domestic workers? It means that domestic work is decent work. I don't know what was our work before, but now our work is decent work. And we have now recognition as the world as workers. But are we going to get that recognition so easy? Are the governments just going to give it to us? No. Because while there's still this exploitation of the, the migrant workers, while the migrant workers is still deprived of their passports, their identity, Convention 189 is not going to be easy to implement. And this is the reality that we're facing. How do we make sure that Convention 189 is going to work for all domestic workers, irrespective? all domestic workers in the world. We need to campaign with the governments. We need to make sure that the governments are listening to our voice. How can we do it? Many of you sitting in this room, you work with governments, you're ambassadors, you work with people. You need to listen to the voice of the domestic workers. You need to understand this shouldn't be a paper convention 189. We don't want a beautiful paper. We want things that's going to work for us. So how are we going to take this Convention 189 further? We decide we need to do something. And in 2013, we formed the first International Domestic Workers Federation. A federation that is controlled by women. Women is controlling this federation. We're not saying we don't want men. We do want you, but you're going to be for once in the back and we will make the decision. And this federation is proving to be a great success. This federation is growing. We've got 57 countries, we've got nearly 500,000 domestic workers, but it don't stop there. This federation wants to ensure that we have a home for all domestic workers. This federation wants to ensure that we become the voice for the voiceless. This federation wants to speak up. We want to enter those countries where they have never been entered before. We want to go speak up for those domestic workers that have been every day. We see the killing in our Arab countries. We see our domestic workers are being treated. This federation must become that voice. This woman that's running this federation, they must ensure that the domestic voice is never silent. We need to ensure that the migrant workers' voice are heard on every country. We need to ensure that in every house, people are going to treat the domestic workers with respect. And that is why the ILO has decided, Convention 189 is not enough. 
What should we do? My fair home campaign. Now everybody say, my home is a fair home. Yes, your home is a fair home. But is your home a fair home for the domestic worker that's working for you? So the questions we're asking you, in this house, do you treat your domestic worker fair? Do you pay your domestic worker a decent wage? Is it safe for your domestic worker? Has she got a good room in the back? So if the employer can answer that, we say, fine, you've got a fair home. To the governments, we challenging in South Africa, I've now decided to challenge my government. I'm asking them, is your home a fair home, all of you that's sitting there making the laws for domestic workers? So this is why I'm standing here tonight in front of you. This is why I'm accepting this award. This award must remind us every day and remind me the struggle is not over. And what I want you to take with you tonight, yes, it's fine, we heard Myrtle speaking, oh yes, I want you to take with you that the domestic workers are not free yet. The domestic workers, many of them are still slaves. Many of them are still earning no wages. We, we need to ensure that that labor brokers, that agencies, we wipe them out. We don't need them to exploit our workers anymore. We need to speak up for ourselves. And I'm always saying that if I could do it in the apartheid years, there is nothing wrong of a domestic worker to challenge her employer and say, I don't need an agent to speak for me. I don't need anybody to speak to me. I want to speak to you now. I want to tell you what I want. I want to tell you what I think is a fair wage. And only if we can achieve that, only if we can do that, as two women in one house talking about their lives. Only if we can say the migrant workers have got a right to go to another country without restrictions, to go and speak for themselves, only then we will be free. I want to thank you for inviting me. I want to thank you, the fairness, for, for giving me the award. You are actually encouraging me to say to me, the struggle is far from over. And together with all of you, we can free domestic workers. I thank you all.